We're thrilled to have Josh Ryer with us today. Josh leads Pura's Office of Utility Programs and Initiatives, and he is responsible for overseeing utility programs vital to delivering a safe, clean, reliable, and affordable grid. Specifically, under the purview of the office are the state's clean and renewable energy programs, so LREG, ZREG, SCEF, um, arrearage forgiveness, vegetation management, resilience, and cybersecurity programs. Um, he's got a pretty full, pretty full remit. Uh, the office is also responsible for implementing strategic initiatives such as the Equitable Modern Grid Framework uh, to modernize Connecticut's electric grid. If you didn't catch the webinar that they held a week or two ago about the Equitable Modern Grid, I commend it to you. Um, it was excellent, and it's just another sign of how extremely active um, this agency is um, in um, really advancing a clean modern grid an equitable clean modern grid for our state. We're very fortunate. We're fortunate that they're so active and we're fortunate that they're also so interested and willing um, to have us involved and to uh, make sure that we understand. And that's really the gist of uh, really the purpose of today's session. It's not just to um, sort of have, have new understanding and new knowledge, but also to then take this understanding and take it back to our communities. And um, the ethos of the Connecticut Energy Network really is um, go try this at home. So I think we're gonna see a, a real, um, it's a new land, it will be a new landscape for solar, for residential solar going forward. So I think there's a lot that we, and a lot of people on this call today, I think um, can take home and take with our communities and advance, advance solar in many ways. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Josh Ryer. Josh, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for uh, those kind comments. And, and thank you, Bernie and Patrice, for putting this on and uh, for having me again. Let me go ahead and bring up my slides. Hopefully everyone can see those now. Um, so as Mark mentioned, uh, I'm Josh Ryer. I'm the Director of Utility Programs and Initiatives at Pira. Um, the disclosure that I always have to give is this isn't legal advice, and this is Josh Ryer's opinion and not that of um, of Pira necessarily. Um, but I'm I'm thrilled to be with you all uh, today, and particularly with this panel um, who have have been through this process for the better part more than three years now. Uh, a bit of a labor of love in in getting uh, to this point um, since kind of the the end of the 2018 legislative session, but I'm really excited to share with you kind of where we ended uh, ended up and then to give an overview of kind of the context of how we got there and what was important to Pira uh, in designing these new programs. Um, certainly you'll see and, and hopefully you'll see and, and I, I think you'll hear from the, the panelists later that there are a lot of a lot of the perspectives from the stakeholders, um, that participate in these dockets, we, we really tried to capture and really to bring the lens of the customer as well uh, in designing the, these programs. Um, so really where I'm gonna start, and let me um, go ahead and go to the, um, the overview of the agenda today. I'm gonna start as always for those that uh, were on our, the last webinar that, that I keynoted for, for PACE um, and any other uh, webinar that I've done, always start with about Pira, because again, I, I can't echo um, what Mark said enough. It's very important for us at, at Pira um, to have your all's in, engagement, whether it's directly on our dockets or through organizations like Solar Connecticut. Uh, it is not possible for us um, to get the decisions right and to have the best possible programs without everybody's perspective. Um, we have a, a, a small team at Pira, a small but mighty team at Pira. Uh, and I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't mention Stephanie Cohen and J uh, Jake Reinhardt, who were, were instrumental in, in getting to this point in this decision. Um, so we have a small team, but it's really, you know, we can't possibly think of everything. So it's really important to not only understand Pierce process, um, but, but to understand how to get involved. I'll talk a little bit about the Equal Modern Grid, just as important context. Um, and then what I'll get into um, is, uh, so I'll set the context. And then I'll get into some of the program design uh, elements and really, again, more of where Pira focused. Um, we have a tough act to follow today. Uh, we were talking about this uh, before every, we let everyone in. Um, the, I couldn't agree more with Mark that um, the, the presentation on Tuesday from uh, our, our colleagues at the Electric Utilities, um, the folks that are actually gonna be the administrators of this program, 
they give a great detailed presentation on eligibility requirements, the different incentives. So certainly encourage everyone um, that wants kind of the nitty gritty of the program design, which I will go over today, um, but really those details to, to follow that. I'm gonna focus more on kind of some of the key things that are important were important for Pira. And then I'll talk about next steps and some other things in case you missed it over the, the last couple of months. So great, so very quickly going about um, over about Pira. Um, I think what's just really important to start with, and I started with this slide last time is, again, we have a specific, we're quasi-judicial. So again, we can, we, what that means in the context of Pira is we can only make decisions based on the information that is put into what are called our dockets. Um, so it's really important. I, I not only emphasized uh, earlier the importance of engagement, but that's why it's so important to us. We, we don't have the ability um, to go out and have conversations with, with folks and then come back and, and make the, the best decision. We actually have to have a, a, an open process and get evidence into the record. So it's, it's really important that that evidence and everyone's perspective is made in the dockets. And then, a, a, you know, I think a fair question on the second point is, you know, so why is Pure the one that's implementing or, or tasked with overseeing these programs? And largely it's, it's been because the utilities administer not only this program, but a lot of the other programs that, that Mark mentioned. And of course we are um, the utility regulator in Connecticut. So just a quick org chart of, of where my office sits in Pura. I won't linger on that. And then why I bring up the equitable modern grid again is, and for everyone that has listened to those webinars before, the equitable modern grid is, is an important lens with which Pura sees all of the work, particularly in front of my office, um, but across the agency. Um, it's, uh, I mean, as the, the name implies, is about making sure that we're modernizing the grid in an equitable and inclusive way. Um, so you've heard some of those themes from, from myself and, and Mark already. Um, but specifically, there was four objectives of that equitable modern grid framework that we issued uh, a little over two years ago now. The first was to enable um, uh, our economy-wide decarbonization goals to meet those or exceed those um, on the timeline that we have in front of us to provide a more resilient, reliable, and secure commodity to customers. So I think obviously this, this program is a key part of that. To enhance energy affordability for customers, again, this program is vital to that. And then to support the growth of the green economy in Connecticut, to make sure we're getting those economic development benefits in, in Connecticut. And of course, the residential solar industry in Connecticut provides uh, significant economic development uh, benefits. As I'm sure you'll, you'll hear from uh, Mike Tran Trahan uh, later today. Great. So the, the context that I want to give for folks, I, I would imagine that everyone uh, on this uh, this webinar today is familiar with kind of our current uh, net me metering paradigm. But I do want to start there just to level set to make sure we're all on the same same page, and it it'll really help in identifying what's different about what we're doing moving forward. Um, so I mentioned, um, so I see, I have here 16244, uh, 243H, sorry. So this is the, of the general statutes of Connecticut. This was actually passed back in the 1990s and went into effect January 1 of, of uh, 2000, actually. So they'll authorize net metering. Now bringing us um, to a, a decade closer, uh, in Public Act 1180, and for folks that are really interesting, uh, interested in um, public policy and energy public policy over the last decade plus in Connecticut. I'd encourage you, if you haven't read or, or skimmed Public Act 1180, I'd really encourage you to do so. A lot of kind of our residual public policy programs and, and other just, you know, the creation of PIRA came out of 1180. So that's a, that's a vital document in energy policy in Connecticut. Um, but one of the aspects, section uh, 106, um, uh, was authorized a 30 megawatt uh, program called the Residential Solar Investment Program. So over the last decade, what we've had in front of us is uh, net energy metering, which I'll talk about in a second, and then the separate incentive program um, that has actually been administered by, and the statute says here, the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority, which, which is actually the Green Bank today. Um, and it was a 30 megawatt program. And the only reason I even put the 30 megawatt part in there, I, I just find it interesting. The program, and as I'll talk about in a second, is well over 30, uh, 350 megawatts um, at its conclusion. So, so it's just an interesting um, contextual historical, historical lens to, to add to this. 
So that's where we're at today. We have net metering plus um, the, the RSIP incentive. Um, that there's there's different types of the, the RSIP incentive. I won't go into those and and frankly sell you a price from the Green Maple as a panelist would would correct anything. So having her here, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to get anything wrong. But what's important is it's an upfront incentive that was in in addition to uh, current net metering. So the the current paradigm that we have it nets production from the solar facility um, with monthly consumption at your house. And it provides kilowatt hour credits that roll over on a, on a monthly basis. So if you've produced more kilowatt hours from your solar system in one month, then if you produce more than you consume on a kilowatt hour basis in one month, you get a credit on your bill and that credit rolls over monthly. And I'm sure plenty of folks on, on, on the line have uh, solar and are familiar with that process. At the end of the year, if you still have any of those credits, um, it's actually cashed out at the wholesale energy rate, which is somewhere between three to five cents typically, or at least it, it has been um, in the last few years. Um, and then just quick, one quick thing for anyone that has been following kind of the, the netting interval part, which was a, a vital part of this decision. Um, just sorry, going back one more slide. So currently we have um, monthly netting. I mentioned that we we net the production and consumption on a monthly basis. And then on an annual basis, um, we provide compensation for any extra credits. It actually, it's it's interesting, um, I'm getting a little energy wonky here, but it, there's there was a bit of a debate uh, in the original docket where we talked about these programs, but whether or not it's actually, that's actually monthly netting or, or annual netting. But, but anyway, I, I digress. Um, so then bringing us up to speed to, to really the most recent public act that sets the context uh, for this, this decision in the new program is Public Act 1935, um, which does, does a few things. It, it places a statutory end date to current net metering, which is uh, at the end of this calendar year, and I'll talk about that later. It authorized an expansion of the RCIP uh, from 350 megawatts, um, or sorry, to 350 megawatts from 300 megawatts. Um, and then actually separately, the Green Bank um, created an RCIP E program that to support additionally, my math was an additional 32 megawatts, but I'll, I'll let Celia correct me if I'm wrong later. Um, so, so really between RCIP and RCIP E, about 380 megawatts um, of uh, capacity additions of residential solar. Um, but again, that, that program that has a capacity limit, which, which we're, we're now at. Um, and then it also directed PIRA to open a proceeding to establish the programs that I'll talk about today, uh, and then directed the electric utilities to start offering um, the new program, and specifically the, the tariffs actually under the program, uh, January 1st of next year. So that's our legislative context um, for today's discussion. The first thing I want to I want to talk about with the new program, and it was really important for us to start. We started um, about this time last year, a little over, probably more like 14 months ago, talking with stakeholders and having a, a technical meeting in the PIRA process about what should the program objectives be. What are we trying to accomplish here? Right. There's all sorts of details that that I'll talk about today in terms of, um, you know, what are the specific rules? How does netting work? Etc. So it's really easy to get bogged down in those details, and I think what was what was really important for us, not only in understanding and designing a program that meets stakeholder objectives, but even in our own internal decision making process, um, and then you know the future of how this program is going to be administered. The question became: What are the objectives? What are we trying? What did the legislature intend um, when they passed this law? And what are we collectively as um, as in state policymakers and stakeholders trying to achieve with this program. So we landed on a five objectives and I'll, I'll actually piece these out into three different buckets in a second. Um, but the first one was, and going back to Public Act 1180, there's this phrase, the sustained orderly development. And that's something if, you, if you've ever listened to Green Bank webinars or programs, um, that's something that you'll hear um, from, from folks at, at that agency often. Um, and so we really focus on the sustained orderly development of the state solar industry. And what that means to us, the second phrase is important, is ensuring that we have at least historical deployments. 
Uh, and I'll get into a second where we got the 50 to 60 megawatts per year. So the sustained orderly development of the industry, again, that ensures that we're getting those in-state economic development um, benefits, as well as we're at least keeping progress with our, our climate goals, which leads us to, to objective number two, which is to achieve 100% zero carbon electric grid by 2040, uh, including essentially any adjustments to that 50 to 60 megawatts per year to get there. Now, there's, there's interesting context for, for that goal. Um, it was it included in uh, Governor Lamont's uh, Executive Order 3, I believe. Um, and it, it isn't technically uh, you know, a, a statutory goal at the moment, but I think regardless of that, I think we, we see it as when we're thinking about these solar programs and the deployment under them, it, it's a helpful target to at least where we're sitting in you know, 2021 trying to get to in 2024. The third one is balancing participant costs and benefits uh, with non-participant costs and benefits. So really what's the electric sector? What are the benefits and costs to, to rate payers as a whole? I'll talk to that uh, about that in a second. And then four and five became actually even when we got into the nitty gritty of how are we gonna design this program became incredibly important. Um, the first was it not only ensuring, the number four I should say, was not only ensuring accessibility for customers, but providing sufficient protections from customers. I, I'm sure folks have seen the, the articles or know a story about a, a customer that didn't quite understand what they, they were signing up for and now they have a contract for 20 years. Um, but also doing all of that through a way that's, that's understandable for customers, right? It, I, well, I'll get more into that in a second, but really objective number four is about bringing the customer lens to the program. And number five um, was really about in, you know, and this is bringing the kind of the equity and inclusivity lens to the program, not only, you know, being inclusive in our program design. So, you know, I think one of the ways that we see that, and I'll talk about in a second, are, are adders. Um, to make sure that any financial disincentive to deploying in those communities and uh, EJ and low income communities are addressed, but, but also to bring that lens in program design, right? I, I mean, I'm going to be a little flippant, like I, I don't think sometime, sometimes uh, it's, it's kind of let's throw an incentive at this and, and we don't think about, hey, what are the broader issues? And I think it was really important for us to not just say, okay, let's add it, let's add an adder here, right? It's about how do we design this program in a way that really does truly um, and in a sustained fashion increase inclusivity? Um, so I promised I'd, I'd break it down into three buckets. Um, so the first two, I think the first two objectives you can kind of lump together, right? It's about what are we trying to achieve in terms of deployment, right? What's our pathway forward? And, and I, I think this is a pretty unique, um, and, and Kyle from Sunrun on the, the, the panel later can, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a pretty unique lens to bring to program design at a state level. Um, oftentimes, we can kind of get derailed by uh, disagreements on, on, you know, what, what uh, and, and it's an important question about what the value is, but I think there's all sorts of, you know, value questions that we can get derailed by or, you know, costs and benefits on things that people just don't, don't agree on, right? And we're just going to have two sides to, to that argument. Where we did see agreement, and I think uh, you know we see this in uh, Deep's IRP in terms of what the what's needed from uh, residential solar to get to 100% zero carbon, um, was an agreement that we need the sustained orderly development of this industry, and we need to continue to encourage at, at least 50 to 60 megawatts per per year. So it, it simplifies a lot of the kind of incentive level uh, compensation conversation that we all have because we now know, okay, that's what we're trying to aim for. And then everything else, well, not everything else, but a lot of the other details um, that often derail these processes, uh, at least from what I've seen in other states, um, kind of is, is simplified to a certain degree. Um, in terms of a balancing participant costs and benefits, um, if this actually is um, a little bit ironically getting into uh, that, that value conversation that I said that often gets so sticky, um, I, I think um, I think there were there were some easy ways though to think about this uh, I, and and the one big one for us and what you I'm sure um, uh, have heard from me and other presentations often is about the importance of process and I've talked about it already today 
Um, but having the ability to, so we've authorized annual uh, reviews of the rate to make sure that, sure, sure, let's make sure the rate is enough to, to be hitting our 50 to 60 megawatts per year. Um, and actually what I didn't get to in, in the last slide that I should have is that was actually his, what we've seen up through 2020. This last year, we've actually seen closer to 70 megawatts deployed on an annual basis. Um, but so the, the question then to, to us becomes, okay, if one and two are, are set, then you know, let's make sure, yes, that if the ITC goes away, we have the ability to increase the tariff to make sure we keep deployment. But also if we see cost declines, the, word, the tariff isn't too high or, or higher than it needs to be to, to hit 50 to 70 megawatts, right? So it's important to have that process and you know, not only that process, but that under that process that helps us understand, you know, what are the incentive levels, so everyone you know has that information. And then the last thing I'd say too, and it's more of a you know specific granular point on on this is, I think er, somewhat early on there was um, agreement on some of the the administrative costs of these program of this program really are are only incurred because it's specific to the program. So there's a new part of this program where there's an application fee that covers kind of the, the program specific administrative costs. And so that's one way to, to um, it lessen kind of the administrative costs that are socialized among other non-participants um, that don't have the ability to participate. Um, and then the, the last four, when I get into, in terms of, um, uh, sorry, the last two objectives, four and five, um, one, uh, for anyone that was on the webinar on Tuesday, yes, I did steal um, a slide from uh, our utility colleagues, so, so thank you. Um, but so, yes, I talked about the importance of uh, incentive adders and really being targeted and thoughtful about how we encourage uh, deployment and uh, in participation in those communities. Um, but it also was important to, to, to really, again, simplify the program design. I think what we heard a lot, um, and, you, and you heard me at the outset talk about uh, how this has kind of been a three-year process. There's been multiple PIRA dockets. There's been mo multiple pieces of legislation. And what we learned kind of year one, or at least what, what I feel like I learned year one, is if, we, if it's not going to work for customers, in it, and if it's, and they're not going to be able to understand it, and is, and developers aren't going to be able to explain it, then then we're not going to be able to meet objectives one, two, and three, right? So that would that became a really important um, again as we got into these very specific um, program details. The, objectives four and five became increasingly important, right? So how I'm going to walk through the the program design today is there's actually two decisions. Um, that are really vital and set the stage for all of the program documents and administration that the, our utility counterparts uh, will, will be in charge of. So the first one really set kind of the high level, this is program designed um, and that decision and it's hyperlinked here. So when, when these slides go out, you have access to it. Um, it's back, is from back in February, um, from Pura, and it was actually in, do I have the docket number there? No, I don't. It was in docket number 200701 um, for folks that are following along at home. Um, so so what is, what's the program summary? So this slide actually generally um, is covering things that are mostly set in statute or in, in a lot of, a large part of Pura's job is to interpret statutes and to, to understand you know, what are our legal requirements so I think it, what was clear from the statute was that these new programs were intended to be a successor to the current residential solar offering, which is net metering plus RCEP. There is not a cap to deployment, but as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of targeting with, with the incentive rates between 50 to 60 megawatts per year. Um, and that it, it is, um, it, and what is explicitly in the statute is that it's a utility administered program. Uh, again, when it starts is in statute, I mentioned that earlier, it's next year, um, but it actually is a six-year program um, that will run through 2027. And then there's a couple of other statutory requirements. Um, it's only for systems up to 25 uh, kilowatts. It's got to be a, a class one resource. So actually, we, we talk about this often in the context of solar, um, but actually, you know, 
residential fuel cells, residential run of the river hydro, all of those resources would be eligible and are eligible for this program. Uh, the tariff term is 20 years. An important uh, note too on that is, so the RCEP program uh, was for the RECs, the Renewable Energy Certificates, um, or um, that were included in, or credits, sorry, that was, uh, was going to say, Renewable Energy Certificates or Renewable Energy Credits. Um, so RCEP, so currently we kind of have net metering for energy and then RCIP for the RECs. The tariffs are for both. Um, and, and then we also have, which is interesting, uh, and again, it's, I'm pretty sure is unique to Connecticut, um, although Rhode, I Rhode Island has kind of two different programs, but the statute has in, in place that both tariffs, two different tariff offerings have to be offered by the utilities. There's this buy all rate and the netting tariff, which I'll get into now. So the buy all rate is really, um, it's, it's similar to, to uh, folks that are familiar with a feed-in tariff. Um, it's a fixed compensation rate over 20 years. Uh, the, and the payments are applied to customer bills with the option for the customer to have an annual cash out. Um, uh, that's actually the default. I'll get into um, where there's an option to not do that in a second. And then one of the reasons I set the context on what we currently have is to, to show you the differences because they're, they're subtle with the, the netting tariff. So while the new netting tariff is similar in that it applies monthly netting uh, it, or it looks at monthly production versus monthly consumption, um, it actually, and it, it compensates or provides a credit based on that difference, it actually provides instead of a kilowatt hour credit, it provides a monetary credit now. Uh, and those monetary credits actually roll over in perpetuity. So there's no different cash out at, uh, at, at the end of the year. It just keeps going until your service is terminated. Um, with the exception of, this is where the netting tariff um, does still have a separate uh, rec payment, a potential separate rec payment that I'll get into later. Um, that would be made directly to the customer or to a third party, no less than annually. There's a, a couple of times uh, as I go through the next couple of slides where I'll say no less than, that just means that the utilities if they so choose um, could do it more frequently. And there's actually an example of that, I think on the next slide. Great, so I just mentioned um, that there's an option. So I said that the compensation goes to the customer, but there's an option, that's the default. There's an option for that to be different. And that's, so we, we authorized, um, again, an another thing that I, and you'll see throughout these slides, I, I try to highlight what are new program rules, what are the same and what are which something that's similar but changed. And this is a completely new option um, where it would allow under the buy all, it would allow a customer to um, actually have a portion of that compensation go directly to um, the solar company or another third party. Um, so for example, if you had, instead of, um, having a PPA with a company flat PPA for 20 cents over 25 or over 20 years, which is a hypothetical, um, that maybe you could actually uh, assign the utility to, to pay directly a portion of the buy all tariff to the, the developer, again, directly, and that the remaining portion, so the, the rate, I'm kind of cutting to the, the end here, the rate that we authorize is around 30 cents, 29.43 uh, cents. Um, so the remaining portion, that nine and change cents, would then go to the customer. Again, it is a hypothetical. Now, under the netting tariff, um, there's only the option for the rec compensation, if it exists, to go to um, a third party, and that would be um, actually, there's no, you can't assign a percentage. It's, it's all or nothing in, in that case. Um, and then these, these payments would be made at least quarterly. And this is where I said, well, our decision, Pierre's decision said at least quarterly. Um, if I read the slides um, and understood the presentation correctly, looks like it's actually gonna be monthly from, from UI. Um, and then, um, and so why does this matter? Why is this something that, that's worth highlighting? I think there's two things that we heard um, in, in the process, because this actually was originally proposed um, by the Green Bank. And I think there's two areas that this could be helpful. Um, the first is we see there, there's, there's several barriers to deployment in low-income communities 
Um, but one of those is the credit worthiness of the off taker, right? Is whether if you have a bad credit rating, um, it can be difficult. And I know the solar industry has done a lot to try and overcome that and get their financing partners comfortable um, with different credit scores. Um, but it can be difficult to deploy because of that. So by having essentially taking out um, the, the customer as the off taker and actually having payments come directly from uh, the utilities, it could potentially help with that issue. The other one is, and it'll, I guess it will remain to be seen whether or not um, the industry takes this up, but there, it does create the option for potentially uh, a more straightforward customer experience in that the, the example that I provided um, earlier, you know, we, Pure Act has a call center and we get calls all the time, Department of Com Consumer Protection gets calls all the time, confused about, okay, I have a solar bill and I have a, um, I have a utility bill, I'm not sure what I'm saving. And the scenario I provided earlier where instead of having a separate bill and the utilities directly pay the solar company, all of the customer would see would be a separate check um, from, from the utility for having gone solar. So effectively it would look like a, a program where the utility is paying you to go solar, right? So again, there's a lot uh, assumed in that and certainly the, the, the industry would have to take that up, but that those are kind of, that's the thought process that, that went into authorizing this. Um, one quick, I'll just go over this quickly, but I, I think it, it, it'd be hard to understate the importance of the Connecticut Green Bank in the current um, RCEP program and then just to residential solar in, in, the, in the state um, as a whole. So because of the change in, in program, uh, Pura actually has a separate office, separate from me, called the Office of Education, Outreach, and, and Enforcement, who actually um, often, for anyone that's tried to email me when, when we have a proceeding open, I, I, I'm unable, because we act like a court, to, to talk about a substantive matter while some, I'm reviewing something or my office is reviewing something. However, that's not the case with this office. Um, so this office, and the, we actually have a wall up between us. So this office will be not only charged with um, helping to provide resources um, to, to the industry, although obviously the, the utilities are, are, are already starting that and have done a great job so far with that, um, but also we'll be working with the Green Bank to make sure on the enforcement side of things um, that consumers are protected. Uh, I'm going to skip through all of these additional rules. They're here for your um, benefit. The, the, the two that I will quickly highlight, though, are there's an important rules that we want to make sure. In statute, it says that the systems can only be sized to the, the on-site load of the customer. What was important to us is we have all of these other state public policy objectives around beneficial electrification, whether it's the deployment of EVs or uh, electric heat pumps. So we didn't want to forget about that, right? We have to make sure that we're, we're taking that into account when these systems are sized. Otherwise, we could be disincentivizing another pub public policy objective. Um, and then the other part, portion I wanted to mention as well is that there's, like in other states, we've actually authorized consumer protection forms in a, in a consumer web page that will hopefully provide customers with not only more information than they have now, but all the information they'd need to, to be able to make informed decisions uh, before going solar. I'm gonna skip over those ones. Great, and so then I'm gonna, what we also did talk about a lot in this decision, and this sets up um, what I wanna talk about with the, the second decision, um, is how are we gonna set the compensation rate, right? Currently, uh, as we mentioned, there's an RCIP incentive that's set, um, and then net metering provides an additional incentive. So these tariff rates, and for, for folks that are unfamiliar with electric tariffs, all, all a tariff really is, is it's the, kind of the contract terms and conditions. And then the tariff rate is the, the actual compensation rate that you're provided. So the, the statute that I mentioned, uh, 1935, um, set in, in stone kind of the couple of ways that PIRA could set um, the compensation rate. And we really focused on this, this what is called a cost plus um, approach, which is to say that we will set the rate for compensation based on what it costs to install, install solar plus a reasonable rate of return. And 
to us, what we really focused on on that, what what is it, what does a reasonable rate of return mean? Was what's a reasonable rate of return to ensure that we're deploying roughly 60 megawatts per year, uh, as we talked about previously. So the decision based on some historical data that was provided set that reasonable rate of return between nine and eleven percent um, for those that that um, are into cash flow modeling and um, and, and uh, solar financing. So it was set on uh, a nine to eleven percent internal rate of return, actually an unlevered uh, internal rate of return. Um, and so that was the range that we said, okay, that's a reasonable rate of return to ensure roughly sixty megawatts per year. Um, and then specifically, the buy all was set at, at 10%. Um, that one's just a little bit easier to target. And why that's important is, um, so with the buy all, it's pretty, I want to say it's it's easy to set that rate. But if you, you plug in a 10% IRR, and there's actually a tariff model that, that goes with our decision that I'll talk about in a second, um, that, that spits out a number. So if you put in 10% IRR, it spits out a number, uh, you know, 29 cents that I mentioned earlier. With, with netting, it's, it's more difficult to, to target an IRR because you already, there, the compensation is based on what the retail rate is, right? What your, your kilowatt hour, your cent per kilowatt hour rate is being charged currently. So you have to make some assumptions around that. And then the question becomes, if that's your baseline, is that enough on its own net metering to provide a nine to 11% return? If it's not, then that's where a rec um, at least in our opinion, if we're trying to get to 60 megawatts per year, you know, what is the rec incentive needed to make sure we get there? But then if it actually, if net metering is above 11% and what we've historically seen, this is where we get back to um, objective number three in terms of not paying more than is needed to, to hit our target of between 50 and you know, really 70 megawatts per year. Um, so then in that point, we'd actually be able to authorize a charge um, a, a non-bypassable charge or a customer charge that ensured that the, the level was at 11% return. Um, and then the last note, and I mentioned the process earlier, um, again, the decision also uh, authorized uh, a process that will start in August every year, or at least the docket will be open in, in August every year. Uh, we're recognizing now that we might need a little bit more time than that, um, that will then set the rates for the following year for all of the systems that apply in the following calendar year. And again, the, the most important things that we'll do in that process among, among others is to make sure that our rates based on our, our deployment rates are where we want them to be. And if they're not, to, to adjust the rate accordingly and then to take into to account any market changes or changes in the underlying costs. Great, so I'm gonna go on to, so then, uh, and Mark had mentioned at the beginning, uh, an October 6th decision uh, that we just recently put out. And this decision really got into uh, authorizing a tariff calculator, authorizing the final rates, and then approving um, the, the detailed documents that the uh, utilities had provided that really are all of the nitty gritty in terms of program eligibility and the program rules. So again, the, the, pro, the, the decision reaffirmed what I just walked through. Um, it authorized a tariff um, model um, that Celia could tell you way more about than I, than I could at this point. Uh, she actually was involved in, in submitting uh, what became this final, um, this model. And then it, and it, then it authorized the, the rates that might be a little bit difficult for you to say, see here um, for the buy all, which was um, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, 29.43 cents in both utility service territories. And then because of, and I'm sure there'll be questions on, on this later, because of how the, the tariff was calculated based on that nine to 11% IRR, the, the model then spit out um, a rec rate for uh, Eversource customers that are take service under this new netting uh, rate for 2022 of about three cents. But then for UI, because UI's retail rates are, I believe, about four cents higher currently, it actually, the model said, no, there doesn't actually need to be a rec incentive in, in UI to ensure sufficient supply. And then as I mentioned earlier, and, and you saw in that slide, there are uh, adders for customers that uh, meet different levels of, of criteria. The low income adder is for anyone 
um, that is below 60% of the state median income. And then uh, the Department of, or DCD, Department of uh, Economic and Community Development, I believe is the title. Um, they also have a list of distressed municipalities. So anyone that, that doesn't meet that first adder, um, but is in one of those distressed municipalities would get a second adder or a, a separate adder, I shouldn't have said a second, a separate adder um, that's a little bit lower. Um, so then I'll quickly go through uh, this. So like I mentioned, we, we approved the program documents submitted by the utilities. One thing that was a point of discussion and is important for developers to, to know is that um, HES audits are an important part of this new program design. We, we didn't wanna lose sight of the fact that energy efficiency and solar need to go hand in hand. However, we're, we're aware of the fact that um, you know a lot of those audits are back. Uh, people are unable to schedule those currently, or, or it's difficult to schedule them, and certainly difficult to actually have those audits currently. So the requirement in the program is actually to schedule an energy audit uh, before interconnection. So we're hoping to encourage energy efficiency through this, but not necessarily have it as a barrier to actually deploying uh, solar in Connecticut. Um, and then just some clarifications I mentioned earlier, net metering is, current net metering is, is gonna be offered through the end of the year. For uh, We clarify that that's for anyone that submits an application for net metering before the end of the year. So if you get your application in, you're safe. Um, and then we made some other small changes. But one thing to note too, is that the we haven't yet set the, the customer fee yet. Great. All right, so um, so next steps. What, what do you all need to know moving forward? But the first is, uh, if you haven't watched uh, Tuesday's event uh, provided and the, the detail provided by the utilities, go do that. I, I believe the PACE folks have those, those slides and I would imagine we can share those after this event. Uh, and then I have on here, um, there's all sorts of, before the end of the year, all sorts of process um, that the utility teams are planning to undertake to help folks understand the program. I think, at least from my perspective, the one that probably is going to be the most useful or one of the ones that's going to be the most helpful is these webinars on the actual application portal, right? <laughs> the devil's always in the details and how do I, how do I click send? Um, so I think those will be very helpful. Um, and then for folks that are, are looking for all of these program manuals and docu documents, they are currently in PIRA's uh, docket folder uh, 210802. Uh, before this webinar, I was on a, a meeting where we were talking about uh, our system isn't the best necessarily. Um, so, so that's certainly understandable. So I've contacted information at the end if anyone is looking for those. Um, but all of the documents will be submitted in one place on December 1st in, in that docket. And then uh, in January of 2022, uh, folks should go to the, the utilities website to sign up. Um, there were some questions around making sure the, the storage program that we that Pira just off, authorized and the Green Bank will be administering with the utilities. Um, there was some discussion around making sure the wiring uh, of those systems actually will work. Um, so there, there's gonna be revised metering guidance um, that's hopefully a little bit more detailed and helpful for developers on January 1st. Um, and then one, uh, one last thing that I, I wanna note um, before we, we go to question and answers is that you know, with any new program, there's, the, you know, there's always the potential for, for hiccups in the beginning or for, um, you know, for deployment to be off based off of you know, one factor or another. So it was really important for us to add in actually compliance in July of next year for for a period to almost take a first half of next year review and say hey are we did we get this right are we going to be close to our 50 to 60 megawatts per year and if we're not it gives us the ability to kind of make a half ha halfway through the year adjustment which is unique to this year it's not something that that you know we think would be good for the industry or for us to do every year but certainly we recognize in the first year um there's the potential for for unforeseen circumstances um Great, and then my last slide just has uh, some of these in case you missed it, um, uh, things. So I mentioned the storage program, also hopefully folks saw the electric vehicle infrastructure program. There's also for small businesses that are on the line and interested, there's a new volumetric rate in Eversource. And then Mark already mentioned the, the webinar that we gave on the equitable modern grid um, a couple weeks ago now. So with that, I know that's, that's a lot to digest. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to diving in on the questions and answers. Uh, and, and look, looking forward for the discussion today. 
gosh, thank you. Thank you very much. I've never seen a chat uh, as active as the one that's going on as you were talking. A um, couple questions I'd pull out and Mark, uh, just call time when I go over. Big question is what happens after 20 years with both the netting tariff as well as the buy-all? Does it, does it just end or how does compensation continue after 20 years? That's that's a great question. Uh, I have a shockingly bad answer for you. Um, that did not come up um, once in, in, in the two proceedings that I just outlined. Um, so we're we're now aware of that, um, and, and you know certainly that is something that we should have addressed already. Um, but we're aware of that. I think uh, without you know having formal uh, formal direction on that. Um, it, you know, publicly, what I, I can say about that is what would happen now, right? If so, if today a customer ended their tariff term or agreement with someone, they would just revert back to um, whatever standard or other tariff that the utility was offering, right? So I think it would be fair to say um, if you're a, uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of you would fall back on what whatever other applicable tariff rates were in place. So I, I think that amounts to uh, to, to be continued. Is a, <laughs> <laughs> That's um, fair. That's fair. Have, have a question from uh, Michael Yule, who works a lot with low middle income residents, specifically around you've got a landlord situation in a building where you have um, four four or under households. So it's a residential structure. Can can they? If there's two cases, if you if the uh, tenants pay their bills. And other the other where the the landlord pays their bills, and I can the landlord aggregate the demand off the the four meters and put solar up commensurate with the the four families households. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, man, you you give give me two questions right off the bat that I can't answer. Um, I think I I I well, first off, I think I would actually defer to our uh, utility counterparts. So maybe we'll see if they have an answer to that. Um, later, if that's something that's come up yet, um, I don't see why under the the buy all that that isn't a possibility. But I'm going to hedge my bet and say um, there are certainly could be things we haven't we haven't thought of yet. Um, Josh, I, I get a snicker bar for every question you can't answer, so <laughs> keep it up. Um, is it possible to go in on a net metering basis and then switch over to a buy all basis? In other words, can you switch between the two tariffs or are you locked in for a 20 year ride? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I believe you're um, I, I subject to check. I believe that you're locked in. You're locked in. Great. Um, one question. Came, and I think you made it clear that the 50 to 60 is sort of a continuation of historical trends. I would I would venture a guess that 99% of people on this on this call would love to you know triple that number. Um, if if we do so, is there some natural point at which the system will break, or could we, if we through advocacy and education and so forth are able to push past the 50 to 60 uh, megawatts? Uh, is that can we do that? Yeah, that's a great question and one I can't answer um, or, or at least try to. Um, yeah, I think it's um, there. There does become a point. I, I so we're not going to break the system at least in the next couple of years if we do 100 megawatts per year. Um, we're going to need more staff, um, not not just parallel, but the utilities will need more staff to, and not only interconnection staff, uh, but probably program administrative staff. Um, to do that from a, a system perspective, it's not necessarily that we would we would break it. It's that for those that work in Massachusetts, you you start hitting transmission issues, right? And you have there's all sorts of technical um, transmission reliability studies that end up happening at the ISO that then just that slows everything down, right? So uh, so this is where and then obviously as you it depends, it becomes very localized as well, right? So uh, uh, there's the transformer that we care about first, 
Um, so if, if we've overloaded the transformer, and as I'm sure all the developers here have uh, experienced running into one of the uh, one of those, you would start hitting that more often, mm -hmm. um, and then you would start hitting substations that need to be upgraded, and then you local substations, and then you start hitting transmission issues. So it becomes a it, it frankly becomes more of an interconnection issue than a balancing and reliability. I mean, certainly. I'm sure there's um, maybe there's engineers from the, the utilities on the line that are um, pulling out their hair at, at this answer in terms of like there there does become more reliability I'd say concerns or you just have to think about how to operate the system differently but but from a can we deploy more perspective it becomes an interconnection issue uh, in question and that's something that we're working on as well. We, we've authorized two working groups, a technical and a policy working group to try and get it out in front of some of the issues that Massachusetts has. So certainly there's some ways to think about that and to potentially even socialize some of those interconnection costs uh, if we do have a public policy goal to, to uh, hit more. Um, but yeah, from a kind of bulk system perspective, we, we, could, we could probably do it. I, you know, I'm making promises for engineers. But then the, la the last thing I'll say too is it becomes, it becomes a question for, for objective number two then, right? Uh, and, the, and that's why I mentioned in a, um, when I was talking about objective number two in terms of having 100% zero carbon goal uh, or grid by 2040, um, it, it, it's kind of a wedges analysis, right? And the, the deep IRP got into this a little bit, um, but it becomes, okay, what, what are the resources, what's the resource mix that we want to, and what's the best resource mix to get to where we wanna be, which is 100% zero carbon grid by 2040. And then what, so what's everyone's piece of the pie, essentially, right? Residential solar, commercial solar, utility scale solar, right? What, what, is, what does that look like and how do we, we move forward that way? And what the, the, the current deep IRP said was 50 to 60 megawatts per year gets us there. Gotcha. So I think uh, I'll just summarize. I th that's a good answer. Um, there's the tariff structure that Pura has has created here does not limit us. However, the the uh, the law the laws of electricity and electrical engineering considerations of load and variability and so forth could, could be limiting factors. Yeah, and just one more thing I'd say too. You're I think you hit the needle on the head with uh, the nail on the head with the the first thing you said, which is. Yeah, if, if the legislature came out and said we want 80 megawatts per year, right? That would just we just have to change the incentive, um, but we have a process to do that set up, right? So we're that's the point of the process being so nimble. A very practical question came up from a from a, a town uh, employee. Many of the people in Patrice's network have sponsored solarized programs and are used to advocating and articulating on behalf of the residents um, what the tariff program is. Would either Pura or perhaps the, the two utilities have a, a speaker's bureau or the ability to do a library presentation uh, if they were invited to, to a town? Yeah, so, so we are, we, I can speak for Pura. Um, we're happy to to, to go to a town and, and talk about this, um, talk about this program, talk about any of the programs, frankly. Um, that's, yeah, that it, it certainly, uh, it, it does become a resource capacity issue sometimes, but that's something we're, we're more than happy to do our best to, to set up and have those presentations and talk through things. I will say, um, in what was evident with your first two questions, some of the nitty gritty stuff that, that town folks might be interested in, um, would be, um, you know, the utilities might be best suited to answer those, some of those questions. But I will say, you know, I think I would, uh, I mean, I'd certainly encourage folks to sign up for those, um, the kind of the, the webinars that are for the remainder of the year, because that, those are really, I mean, that's, I've never, I haven't seen that in other programs before. And so it's, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one time that they're scheduling. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> like walking through how, how, and I, frankly, as a, you know, at a policy level, hopefully we were able to get at as many people that might have issues with going through the portals. I know that wasn't your question. The, the direct question for Pira, if we would, uh, we would be willing to do a presentation is absolutely. Bernie, that's a really good, um, a really good segue to giving our utility friends a chance to, uh, to, uh, to pipe in. But first, I just want to thank Josh. Josh, um, that was 
um, just extremely clear, extremely thorough. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think some of us are glad we recorded it because it's also a ton of information and we can go back and look at it and go back over your slides. But that was um, just really great. Thank you very much. Um, if you're if you're through with your slides, you could, you could you could stop sharing. And what I what I did want to do just as, as um, sort of before we move, there's still a ton of questions in the chat, and I hope we have time for everybody to get their questions answered. But um, in the meantime, before we go into the weeds or move on to the panel, I just thought it might be appropriate to ask our two guests from uh, from the utilities. We've got Hannah Savage from uh, Eversource, and we've got Marissa Westbrook from from. Avangrid. So I want to invite you to, um, if, if you'd like, feel free to unmute yourself now and you could respond in part either to the question just posed about whether you'd be willing to go to towns to present this or in general, um, anything sort of high level about what, you know, what Josh just covered. Um, would I invite you to comment now. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. This is Marissa Westbrook from UI. Thanks so much for uh, inviting us uh, to respond to the question that was just raised about speakers. Um, from UI's perspective, we are very happy to, to come and speak uh, to groups about this program and any other programs that we offer as well. Um, so always open to doing that. Uh, we are going to continue to develop content that we will um, post uh, eventually on our websites as a resource as well. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll turn this over to Hannah to, uh, to answer from the Eversource perspective and uh, from, uh, from, from her team. Yeah, great. Thanks, Marissa. And uh, it's good to be with everyone today. Likewise, we're always happy to engage with our communities. Um, we have, you know, community um, specialists that usually I think there's one assigned to every town. So if it weren't to be me or someone on my team, we're always happy to, to disseminate information through all the channels that we have. So um, you could either reach out to me or your normal um, community contact. Either way, we're happy to get you the information you're looking for. Terrific, thank you. Thank you both very much. Um